Hello, everyone. Welcome to this Q&A session with Tanya Quintieri. Hi, Tanya. How are you? Oh, wow. Hi, everybody. Good to see you guys. Haven't been back to Crowdcast in a while. So Yeah, Tanya is our longtime friend. Uh, I'm sure most of you know who she is, but we will anyway give her the chance to, to introduce herself. Tanya has been recently nominated as a best mentor of the world of the year by ProZ. So, um, and we thought, why not talk about this and about mentoring in general with her? So, Tanya, um, maybe you can introduce yourself to those who don't know you yet. Okay, um, I'll try to keep this sweet and short. My name is Tanya Quintieri. I am the lead translator and talent manager at The Translators, um, which is a small, almost agency in, in Prague. Um, but please refrain from sending me your CVs. <laughs> I'm, I'm not that big yet that um, that, that would make any sense. Um, I'm a US American with German, Lithuanian, and Puerto Rican roots. Um, I've worked as a freelance translator since 2002. And so that gives me, what, 15 years of experience under my belt. And with regard to mentoring, I started out with interns and university interns. Um, so these were mandatory internships that students had to make from the universities in Gammersheim and Heidelberg in Germany. And also someone from Magdeburg, I think. And then from there, I started looking into mentoring as I was um, together with a colleague uh, designing a mentoring program for the association that I was a part of. And that's how I got into mentoring. So yeah, that's me here today. Very, very happy about the nomination on pros. Um, certainly didn't expect that, but there you Do go. Do you know who could have nominated you? Did no. someone already out themselves? Nope. Okay, so this is a little secret. So, um, we had some polls here. I just want to share the results. Maybe you already saw them. We asked, have you ever mentored someone as a translator? Three people of 11 said yes, and I liked it. Eight people said no. And we also asked, have you ever been mentored as a translator? One, one person was, and nine wasn't, weren't. And also you asked, would you as a mentor expect to be paid for mentoring? And everyone who voted said, it's hard to say, so I guess we'll get to this topic at some point, but I want to start with a broad question um, about why should one mentor at all and what's in it for the mentor? Mm -hmm. Well, of course, I can only speak from personal experience and from the work I did at the association that I was a part of, but personally speaking, um, there is no short answer to that, definitely. Um, I mentor because I truly believe that our profession is in some ways unique as you have people coming in who study translation um, and they don't learn any business skills or no viable business skills at the university. And then on the other hand, you have people who come with a totally different background, like myself. I'm, I'm Before I, I freelanced full time, I worked for IT companies in HR and marketing. And I had no idea about translation. Um, so there's a lot of gaps that need to be filled. And you can do that you know, yourself over a long span of time and make many mistakes and, and hurt a lot along the way in so many ways, be it financially, emotionally, um, whatever. And then you have the option of teaming up with somebody who might have you know, gone through that phase themselves and who are able to share their findings with you. And <clears throat> just because there are so many different ways into our profession, I think it's absolutely a must that we as translators really, you know, team up one-on-one -on -one or in groups, whatever, and that we really help each other out to fill those gaps where we simply lack knowledge or experience just so that we as a profession, as a huge team of profession, that we can be stronger. Um, 
be it with clients, be it with pricing, you know, all that stuff. They always say a team is only as good as, good as it, its weakest link. So I think it's really important that we help each other out to not just have personal success, but also success in our or with our entire profession. Yeah, so it takes thinking on the next level, like not on the individual level, but right. making a step beyond this. Right. Um, so is it, um, is it the only thing that can motivate a mentor? Um, because you ask yourself, and maybe we can get to this question right now. So is it actually, does it actually pay back financially to be a mentor? Do people pay for being mentored? No, no. And I think um, there's another question in our collection of questions here that asks about the difference between coaching and mentoring. Okay. And I think that is one of the things that plays into the difference. Um, mentoring happens on a much more broader level. Um, it, it's not as, you, you know, the sessions that you have with your mentee, they, they might not be as, as packed in, in terms of time as it is with a coach. And your goals as a mentee versus a coachee are going to be totally different. Um, mentoring definitely, I think, is more holistic. It takes much more, much more different um, aspects into account. And I don't think that mentoring should happen for economic reasons. But, but, and this is the but, of course, this has paid out for me. Like the most recent thing, you know, that, that nomination, of course, not everybody is going to end up with a nomination if they, if they mentor. But people might recommend you, people might talk about it, people might thank you somewhere online, whatever. So it does something for your rep reputation. And reputation at the end of the day does turn into hard cash. And of course, if you have a good relationship with your mentee and you kind of level in on, on skills or whatever, I mean, they can help you, you know, take on projects that you otherwise might not take on or they can refer you. I mean, a mentee is always another link in your network that, that can work for you, just like you work for them. And um, so yes, looking at the bigger picture, I do think that mentoring has had some impact on my economic situation. Have you, have you expected this when you, when you no. started mentoring? No. Um, I'm, some of my closest friends often say that, that I have this Mother Teresa trait <laughs> and um, I just like to help. So it's like totally in my nature. I, the first time I took on a teaching assignment was when I was in eighth grade and we had a student teacher day and I got to do two English classes for sixth graders. Um, so it's always kind of been inside me. While I'm not a teacher per se, I, I don't think I'm very good at that. But I do like to share experiences and I do like to, you know, help people out. And at least in my case, mentoring often happens on an emotional level. So, so people, you know, they share their fears with me, their doubts. Um, and, and I like helping people out. So on a personal, personal level, it does a lot for me. Did you have a role model for this? I mean, did you have a mentor? as a translator or, yeah, as a, trans as a translator. I'm sure if I so you, said you, you uh, came to translation from a different industry and right. um, you never maybe expected to become a translator a few dozen years ago. So you entered the industry as a whole newbie. How did it feel and did someone help you out with getting the hang of it? You know what? Like I said, I started in 2002 when I had no idea what I was doing. So, and, and of course, information on the internet was scarce. Um, and even if so, I wouldn't have known what to look for. Like, I didn't know that there was translations, translation agencies until about 2006 or so. And then in 2000... That might have been a good thing, by the way. <laughs> in 2009, I think it was. I found a group of professional translators um, on a business network. And 
you probably know I have a big mouth and, and I like to tell people my opinion and everything. So I got involved in this group quite fast, but I also did a lot of learning and um, listening. <clears throat> and then the group moderator um, asked me if I would like to co-moderate because, you know, I had this totally different angle on the profession. And I said, sure. And a couple of months later, she, she said she didn't want to be the moderator of the group anymore and asked me to take over. So rather than being a mentee myself, I was kind of thrown into this leadership role. And um, I was still, you know, listening and then reading what people were saying. And for myself, because those things were not set in stone, I didn't learn to translate at a university. I didn't learn how to run a translation business somewhere. Um, my processes were very fluid. And I think that helped me to get a healthy view of the translator profession in general and just to tackle things differently. And so, no, I don't think in translation that I really had a mentor. I can't think of anybody right now. I've had people act as soundboards for me, definitely. Um, but again, I think that's something different. Uh, do you think, by the way, coming back to this question about mentoring versus coaching, that a mentee can be a potential coach. So, for instance, you give some tips, and if these tips become too numerous or something, you can also suggest like individual coaching sessions or something. Do you, do you do coaching? Let's start with this. Do I do coaching? No. Well, I don't advertise it. Sometimes people will ask me to to like you know walk them through creating their marketing collateral. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily call that coaching because to me, coaching is something that has a very, um, a very straightforward goal at the end of, of that coaching time. Um, I don't know, like by the end of our coaching, uh, what would you call that? Coaching span, whatever. I want to have a certain amount of turnover or I want to have acquired so and so many clients or I want to have... Um, my business process speed up by whatever factor. So, so I think those are very precise goals. And um, so, no, I, I don't. And I can't think off the top of my head, but I'm sure that I've had moments where, where my work was more about coaching than mentoring. Okay, so anyway, it's not a business asset for you. Let's no, call it. definitely not. Sheriff says in the chat that he likes to do mentoring at a professional level as he feels really excited when he gives advice to other translators. I think that's the main thing maybe on the psychological level behind mentoring. I also wanted maybe to share a few of my own um, thoughts on this because I give tips every now and then to translators who I outsource work to Sometimes they ask a question and that you would have never ever thought about yourself. Right. It might be a business question or a linguistic question. And once you start answering, you start understanding it. For instance, uh, in Russian, we do not usually translate the English word please uh, in various apps and websites and so on. It's not customary to use the word please in every message so and there were a lot of segments where he translated this word please and in one se i kept removing them and in one segment i left it and when he asked me why i had left it i started thinking and i understood something that i did not know before in, in which cases you have to translate it and in which not so i guess it's it really pays back to everyone and uh, by making these translators better professionals you get better um, outsourcers for your work that may come might come in future just okay. five cents from me um i also had this uh, chat message here from paz get well paz by the way uh, she says i think the biggest problem i have found as a mentor and as a, as a mentee is the lack of humbleness Translators sometimes believe they are already the best in everything and will not accept or ask for help. I think this also goes in line with the question we had here about uh, how you choose your mentees and did you ever um, have to refuse mentoring someone? Okay, so that's going to be our next question. Yeah. Yeah. Um... 
I, maybe I've been lucky with my mentees. I don't know. Um, I, I've never sent away a mentee. I have sent away interns, and I've talked them out of freelancing as translators. Um, but I think, you know, if, if you make sure that you get to know your mentee beforehand, and, you know, maybe, maybe it's someone you've interacted with on social media or um, had email exchange with whatever, or, or, you know, maybe spend some time on the phone talking with them. It really, really needs to click. I mean, if you're going to, if you're going to take on that role of a mentor, your mentee is going to have to be able to rely on you. And most likely you're going to be the older one. That's not always the case. It certainly depends on when somebody enters the profession, but definitely you will be the one that that person looks up to in one way or another. And I think a mentee deserves um, that we're honest with them. Um, I remember one case when I was still active in the association. We had this case where a great colleague, I, I know her personally, and I know that she's really sweet, but her and her mentee, they didn't click. So they talked about it very honestly, and, and together we decided that we would you know, match that mentee with a new mentor. Um, and there's nothing wrong about, and, and that's where humbleness comes in, right? There's nothing wrong about discovering that you can't click with another person. I mean, it happens to us all the time in, in life, you know, with friends, with people that we date. So why should that not, you know, be the case with mentees and mentors? And when you, um, when someone asks you, what what characteristics do you look at? Mm, are you willing to help anyone, or does this person has to have some something to, for you to want to help them? Um, there's of course things that I look into. Like I, I'm not very good with people where I have to explain things five six times over and over again, especially not when I explained it in writing and they can't go back to our emails or our chat and just look it up, but they just keep on asking for the same thing over and over again. Um, that drives me crazy. Um, but that's because I think that if you're going to freelance as a translator, you need some kind of proactiveness about your personality because you know you're going to run a business. You, you don't want to go back asking your client 10 times what they need to have on, on the invoice that you send them. Um, so, so you have to be proactive. Um, I love intelligent conversation, um, so I do expect some level of intelligence, and, and that sounds super rude, I know it does, but I'm sure we can all agree that there's just people out there where it just doesn't work on an intellectual level. Um, honesty is really, really important to me. Um, like if I'd have the feeling that somebody's trying to sneak into my into my world, you know, to, to run off with my, my clients or something like that would totally, gosh, or, and, and I don't know if that would be loyalty or, or whatever, but I need to be able to trust my mentee. Um, because as a mentor, you can, you can mentor by, by, by leading either by example or by warning. So by example, you know, you, sh you show them what works well um, for you in your situation. And to lead somebody by warning is, you know, maybe let them in on your failures. And what I, of course, don't want is my mentees running off, you know, behind my back and telling people where I failed. Um, that's something that I decide whether or not I want to share that outside of our mentoring relationship. So it has to be a trustworthy person, honest person. Um, and then for the hard facts, it would be good if they either translated in my languages or in my area of specialization. And ideally, both would be the, the, the case. Um, but that's not always going to happen just because, you know, you never know who you end up mentoring. But yeah, and they should be open. They, they should be open um, just to other ideas and in my case, they shouldn't be personally offended <laughs> when I when I voice critique, because it's never about personality. It's always about procedures and, and results, but never about the person. 
I know that you ran this um, German Association of Translators and Interpreters. Uh, did you have any kind of mentoring program there? Because we have Anna Julia here in the chat mentioning the mentoring program of the Brazilian Association of Translators and Interpreters. Yeah. yeah, that was one of the first things we set up. And that was actually my first public international talk that I did. I, I was invited by ITI to talk about our mentoring program way in the beginning, um, I think in April of 2012. And um, I, I think meanwhile, all major translation associations do offer a mentoring program, or at least in their you know member forums, whatever, they have places where people can match, mix and match. Um, other than that, I mean, there's major groups on Facebook for instance, or, or maybe even on the Smart Cat forum, I don't know. Yeah, I'm thinking about it. There, there's always places where, where people mingle who would like to mentor or who would want to become a mentee. So just ask around. Uh, in case of associations, is it, a, is it a paid endeavor? I mean, or do they also do this like pro bono? I don't know of any mentoring programs from associations that actually cost money. Okay. And if an association would ask for money to do that, that would be very, very, very strange for me. Or to I'm me. just trying to find out how this keeps sustainable. Because on an individual level, I can understand uh, that a person wants to give back to the society. But on an association level, it has to sustain its... On, a, on an association level, basically what you do, and, and that's how most of the associations do it, is... They have a pool of members who sign up to be a mentee or, or who are looking for a mentor. And they have a pool of um, experienced members who agree to be a mentor. And then they match those. And some associations will give you some kind of guidelines, you know, um, talk on the phone once a week or once a month, um, do this, do that, whatever, or they have meetups. And other associations, they will just, you know, mix and match the people and, and answer in case there's any questions or whatever. But basically, it's just running two Excel files and bringing people together. Um, I know that one association in Germany, they, they actually, uh, you have to pass some kind of, I don't know if it's a test or, but, but you have to fulfill certain criteria before they list you as a mentor. Um, I don't know how sensible that is because, there's only so much control you have as an association over what people actually end up doing. And I know that their mentoring programs are time limited, like you sign a letter of intent, sort of, where you commit yourself for two years, um, which I think is not always necessary. I mean, it, it works for them, so it's good, and, and I, I don't know their exact procedures, but for myself, from my experience, there's so many different kind of mentorings. Like right now, um, I'm mentoring a colleague from the UK who just moved to Germany, and an opportunity popped up with one of my clients, and I introduced them. And now he doesn't really know how to approach them because he's never worked with direct clients. Um, and of course, he's a little bit afraid because it's my client, you know. And um, so I'm kind of working him through. I. I we had a long talk before he went to meet that client. We had a long talk afterwards. I'm going to help him prepare the quote. I'm going to help him prepare his work materials and everything. So um, that's a very project-centered um, mentoring. And on the other hand, I have translators who, um, who might deal with totally different issues. And I really don't want to go too much into detail because obviously they trust me. But um, oftentimes, these really happen on a level that has to do with um, self-conscience and self-confidence. And um, yeah, so what was the question again? I kind of got carried away. Um, me too. Um, but I think it was, it was about associations and how they, right. how they right. keep it sustainable. Right. But uh, as it involves a lot of effort, how do you actually limit the time or do you limit the time? Do you discuss this with the mentee? Is it somehow a strict limit for you maybe on the number of hours you spend doing this? 
Um, I, I think it takes a lot of courage for a newbie to reach out, you know, and, and send me or anybody else an email and be like, hey, I like your work. I followed you on social media and I've seen you've given some advice and I have this um, dream that I'm trying to, uh, to, you know, make come true. And would you mind helping me for a while? I mean, that takes a lot of courage. So once that person gets in touch with you and, and you get to know them and you kind of get the feeling, you know, maybe there is something that I can do to help them. Um, those people are usually very grateful and they try not to, at least in my experience, they try not to, to take too much of your time and they're very conscious of, of what you're doing for them or with them. So I've, I've never really had the case where somebody just kept on, you know, coming back, coming back, coming back. At some point, you just hear less and less from them or, or they just report back with successes or, you know, sometimes they'll send a file through and be like, hey, can you have a look at this quote? Um, so it just gets less and less over time. But I think, I don't know, if I'd have to give you an average of how long such relationships last, anywhere from half a year to a year maybe. And then after that, you notice how they, you know, start walking on their own. And is, um, is uh, mentoring more about um, the business side of things or about the linguistic side of things? Do you teach them to be better translators or better freelancers? In my case, it's definitely about being better freelancers. Um, I, I wouldn't claim that I'm the best translator out there. Um, I, I think I'm good in what I do because I'm very specialized, but I'm not necessarily the person to teach others how to translate because, as I mentioned in the beginning, I don't have a formal education. Um, I can't deal with, you know, cat tools the way that others can. I'm, I'm very limited with my cat tools. Um, but you can so, handle smart cats, right? To the extent that I need, yes. <laughs> But don't be asking me about any specifics and, and reviews and God knows what. No, 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 no. Um, so, yes, in my case, it's definitely about the freelancing aspect, the business aspect, um, the, the self-marketing aspect, and, of course, building lasting relationships with clients. Related to this was a question, what skills should a mentor have? And uh, you already talked, said that you must not be the best translator out there but and you already talked about you're always willing to help people but maybe some other also soft skills you can mention it's kind of hard to to describe that well, well let me let me focus my head right now on, on the people that i worked with who wanted to mentor others um, open-mindedness is good. Um, knowing your limits, and I read that somewhere in the comments, I think is really super important. I had a mentee once, um, and she ran into an opportunity where she was dealing with a publisher about translating a book. And while I know a little bit about the legal framework, I've never actually worked with a publisher. Um, so I referred a friend of mine who is a literature translator and they sat down and, and talked that through. So, so that part, that specific part is um, where I brought somebody else in to help. Um, I've had mentees sit down with my tax advisor. Um, so, so you need to know your limits, definitely. Um, you have to be very protective of your own time. Like, you know, you have to be able to say, hey, this week we've really spent a lot of time together. Um, we're going to have to go on with this next week or, or, I don't know, next month, whatever. So um, just to make sure that you're not exploited. And, and I'm not saying that mentees do that on purpose. That's definitely not the case. But sometimes when you're in a topic, you know, and the juices start flowing, um, you can end up investing more time than is good for you or than you can actually afford. Um, so you need to be very assertive about that. Uh, you, you should have a very um, generous mindset, I think. Um, 
I know translators who don't really like to share their knowledge out of fear of, I don't know, people snatching away your clients or, um, you know, they say, hey, I, I've, I've gone through a lot to get to where I am today and why should I make, make it easier for others? Um, so you need a, a specific mindset and What else? I that's think, quite a list already. Yeah, I, I think that's good. I also had this idea. Uh, I updated the polls a bit. So guys, if you already voted, I entered, entered an option. No, I haven't mentored or haven't been mentored, but I would love to. So if that's something you want to answer, then you can change your votes now. Um, anyway, um, you, I, it's not in the list of questions, but I, it was going this way when you talk that you mostly uh, mentor how to be a freelancer. What are the most typical problems uh, freelancers face? Not face, but refer to you. I mean, with which, with what problems do they come to you and how do you help solve them? What are the usual advice? What is the usual advice you give? I mean, um, for the guys who are watching this now, so assuming they will have their men mentees, what can they say to them? I often have to teach them how to not undercharge, just, you know, to, to get their foot in the door. Um, so there's a lot of mindset work in there regarding financial uh, aspects. Um, and then the fear of no. That is a huge one. And, and so many new translators in, in the profession have this fear of hearing a no, um, you know, when they send out a quote or when they ask somebody to, to, to contact on LinkedIn or God knows what, this fear of no, and I find it so fascinating because, you know, if somebody says no, nothing happens, you know, it's not gonna shake your world, it's not gonna mean that you're never gonna get a new client. And, um, and not taking that personal, teaching people or, or showing people how to, how to draw that line between the business me and, and the personal me, and that whatever happens on my business, I can decide whether or not that affects me as a person, or if that hurts me, if that brings me down, if, if God knows what, you know, it's just business. And, and people don't say no because they don't like you. People don't say no because um, they think you're not good enough. People say no because they don't have the budget, because they don't have enough information, because they don't really know what they want. So, um, yeah, pricing, sticking to your pricing, um, talking on an eye-to-eye -eye level with clients or, or prospects, and getting rid of that fear of no. Do they uh, ask you if it's better to work with direct clients or agencies and how it is better to contact these and those? Um, I think that that's totally dependent on the mentee's personality. There's translators where I think, no, you should never, ever work with a direct client. It will only give you headaches and the client too. And then on the other hand, there's, client, uh, there's mentees where I think, yeah, you could do a pretty good job with direct clients because you need the personality, and I think that's where many of us don't appreciate the project managers that, that we work with or that everybody else works with. I don't work with agencies, but um, I do understand that position that, that project managers have. You know, they're, they're in between seats and they're you know, trying to get a good translation. At the same time, they're trying to, to offer the best service to their, um, to their clients. And I outsource a fair bit. So I see how some translators communicate or do not communicate, how diligent they are with their business processes. They're, they're great translators, really great translators, but that part of, of corporate communication, it's, it's so foreign to them. And then that's where I think, you know, that's a good indicator in, in terms of should that mentee work for direct clients or not. Um. I often am, am amazed by the verbosness of translators who are trying to get a client. They write so much that no client will possibly read this, which is which seems strange to me because as translators, we usually 
know what how powerful a text can be and how weak it can be. So for and, me, and there the, seems to be some kind of correlation between, yeah, and, sorry. And less that they think about at what time they're sending that email, the longer the email gets, right? It's like, you don't even know if that person needs a translator and then you're gonna send them an email that's like this long. Of course, nobody's gonna read that. I, I'll tell you something, right? I'm an outsourcer, I'm not even an agency. But every time I get an email that says, dear ma'am or, or dear sir, I don't even open that email. I delete it right away. I do not take the time to respond to that person or to even look at any information they sent me, CVs, profiles, whatever, because no. And, and that's exactly how agencies are going to act or, di or, or direct clients for that matter. You know, if you don't take the, the time to get to know your prospect or, or to find out as much as you can, why should they bother even looking at your stuff? What are the most common mistakes apart from this, dear sir, madam, that translators make in their cover letters or whatever? Actually, there's two really good examples and I shared them the other day in, in one of my Facebook groups. Uh, the first one was a lady writing me from Germany and her subject line said she translates from German into French and from French into German and from French and English into German and from German into English, whatever. Like, like she did all these things, right? Six pairs. Oh. And then I, I was just so curious how somebody, you know, can offer that. So, so I looked into the CV and she had said in her cover letter that um, she has previous experience as a, an assistant to the CEO in some company and that she has a formal education in, in something with taxes, whatever. So I thought, oh, you know, interesting. And I looked and that education was in the 60s. And her experience as a as a assistant to the, SE, uh, to the CEO was, I don't know, somewhere in the 70s or something. And then there was a 20 year gap, God knows what. And I'm thinking, you know, then don't. I mean, aside from the fact that the, that the email was in bad English, and I was thinking, okay, you know, maybe she was nervous. But then I see, no, no. And, and the other one was really, really bad. Subject line, 30 years of experience as a freelance translator. And the lady was born three years after me. So according to her math, she started translating at the age of eight. Well, everything can happen. I started translating Shakespeare at the age of six, I think, but I, I don't include this in my Come on, seriously. Who's going to, that's like, no, that's not how you do business. Yeah, no, no, it's not. But um, what I was going to say, uh, you talked about pairs. I think a usual mistake some translators make is indicate both translating from their native language and to their native language. And I am um, the kind of renegade who does that. I mean, but in many cases, I think people don't understand the level of expectations people have from a translation. So what advice do you usually give to people who want to do this? Do you just say no, never do this or? No, no, say it no, definitely not. Um, I, I think that's a very complex question because whether or not I translate from one language into another always has a lot to do with the kind of quality that is needed for the specific um, translation or a specific project. Plus, don't forget, in some countries, translators are actually trained to do both and they have to do both at a certain level in order to get their di diploma or their bachelor's de uh, master degree. So um, I think it always depends on the kind of text and, and Obviously, if you're going to do transcreation, you don't want to do that into your source language. Um, if you're doing highly, highly technical stuff or, or like, I don't know, things that have to do with chemicals and super weird formulas, whatever, then it might be better to translate from your target language into your source language and then have somebody in the source language, you know, take care of grammar and, and God knows what. So. I think it really depends on the project. I'm not one of those who, who says you have to only, or you may only translate into your native tongue. Because it's just not feasible and, and it's not practical. I do agree. 
Um, guys, any other questions? I'm looking through the ones we had. Um, some of them we are already we have already answered. Can mentoring be done in groups? I asked this, but I think you already talked about some groups. But is this a viable idea? What do you think? Um, I think it is, and um, actually, my own heart group, as I call it, um, the group that's most important to me that I run is the Darlings community on Facebook. And that started out with a few, few people who had signed up for my newsletter and, and they just kept on writing me back and, and asking for more details. So I figured it would make sense to, to have a group, a closed group that's, that's very tight-knit and um, a very safe space to ask questions of all kinds. Um, so that's where I basically do group mentoring and, and every now and then somebody will have a topic and we'll look into that and, and um, you know, they'll get feedback not just from me but also from other people uh, who are in the group. And then we have sort of group works that I initiate about, well, probably about once a month. Um, one month we were looking into um, Googling ourselves and, and kind of taking control of what's out there on the web about us. Um, right now, we're working on a really, really, really tough subject um, about our digital heritage. And um, so, you know, what happens with our digital footprint um, after we pass away? Uh, you never know when something happens and how to take care of that. And of course, when you talk about something like that, many other topics come up. So that's a great place, you know, that you can do in a group. Um, but of course, you can also do group mentoring in real life. Um, I know there's some groups here in Prague that meet on different topics. Um, a friend of mine just launched a business meetup for translators where they just discuss different things regarding their freelance business from marketing to God knows what. And they meet, I think, once a month. Um, that can be a form of group mentoring where, where you also not only just have one mentor that mentors others, but um, where you all kind of mentor each other so. Anonymous, anonymous uh, translators, yeah. Right, something like that. Translators anonymous, I like that. I should save that domain. <laughs> I think it must exist already. Probably. Too obvious. Uh, do you think that such groups might be in part due to translators feeling lonely in general and wanting to just hang out with someone who understands their problems and not exactly with in improving their level as translators or freelancers? I don't know if we feel lonely. Um, that certainly depends on everybody's situation. Um, I, I think it's more about not feeling understood. It's super hard for people who don't translate, who don't, you know, work in our, in our area. I just mentioned this recently, or I think it's going to come up in some printed interview. Um, did something here just jump? Oh, you deleted a question. Um, I was married to a man for 23 years, and obviously he was there every step of the way during my freelance career. And while he was very supportive, you know, and he, he would take care of the kids, and, and when I had a lot to do, he would take care of the dog and the house, and God knows what. So he was very supportive, but very often he didn't understand when I, when I felt upset, when I felt that I got feedback from a client that wasn't um, called for, um, or when, but, but he also didn't understand the very, very positive outbursts that I sometimes had, where, where a line that came back from a client in an email would totally bring me to tears and, and shake my world for that day. Um, Sometimes the people in our social private life just don't understand how how intimate translating can be because you know you're you're totally pouring your all into it to um, maybe not for technical translations I'm not sure but in, in the areas where I translate um, I, I find it very often very touching and then it's you know good to talk to people who understand how much how much work both to me, translating is always a piece of emotional work as well because I like have to tone down myself totally. I have to disconnect myself from my own 
you know, being and, and immerse myself in the writer's uh, personality, you know, like I put on a totally different hat. And to me, that is exhausting emotionally sometimes. You seem to have watery eyes right now as you speak. No? Yeah, because I was just thinking of a couple of projects where that really happened, and I thought it was so sad that I had nobody around me who understood. Yeah, this, this must have sucked. Um, this part of people, people's not understanding what translators' um, profession is about, what do you usually suggest? Because this must be... Um, handling negativity all this kind of thing because you know um there is i won't call names but there is there are some groups on facebook that are seem to be totally based about speaking how how poorly clients behave and agencies behave and so on so i get email notifications every day that mention okay dear agency this okay dear agency that and every time i read this i feel like i share a bit of this negativity but to me, it seems like a disastrous way to handle it, like to pour it out. But or what do you think? Is it do we have to? What's the idea for this vent? Vent our something. I don't know if this has something to do with coming of age or becoming mature or having the right mindset to be an entrepreneur. But I think those people who vent a lot. Oh my gosh, it's really stormy here. Um, those people who vent a lot, those who, who constantly have bad experiences with clients, they fail to look in the mirror and, and see their end of, you know, it always takes two to tango. And if I'm constantly having trouble with all kinds of clients, then obviously I'm doing something wrong. It can't always be the clients. But they're so full of themselves sometimes, in, in the, not in a mean way, right? But they, they just can't look left and right, and, and they, they lack the capability of questioning their own actions. Um, like I said, I outsource a fair bit. And it, it sometimes amazes me how people, like I'll, I'll send them a real long briefing, right? Really, really detailed. They don't read it. They just you know translate away, send me the file, and then I'm like, hey, dudes, please. I told you not to rename the tabs in the Excel file, or I told you to add your name at the end of the file name or, you know, just simple things like that. And yes, that pisses people off. And then, you know, you get a reaction. So, yeah, maybe that's something that mentors need to, to teach their mentees as well, you know, to be able to reflect upon their own actions and own part, their, own their own contribution to, to what makes communication. You, you talked about instructions and also Cherry Place said that so many translators don't read instructions. You know, we had this senior bleed marathon the other day and I tried to publish very detailed instructions and you, you won't believe how many emails I got that were contrary to the, those instructions. And I think the first maybe piece of advice should be just uh, stick on the wall a big letter saying RTFM or something like this because um, I don't know why. why. Why does it happen? Because we read all the time as translators, right? Maybe because we are too focused on the work at hand to look somewhere. Because so many of us think we know it all, and we don't. But well, the, 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 that's the difference, you know, between translators who are able to grow, translators who are able to lead a happy, fulfilling life, both in terms of business and, and privately, is you understand that you have to evolve, that there's always something for you to learn, um, that not always the others are the bad guys. Um, it's not always about us personally. So, like, I don't know, oh my gosh, my client is overdue with his payment for three days, but they don't have the balls to pick up the phone and ask, hey, people, what's up? I mean, it, more often than not, probably something horrible happened. Like just last week, I called a client. I'm like, hey guys, you're supposed to pay within 10 days. Now it's been 30 days. I'm going to have to, you know, take action. And she's like, oh, I'm sorry. Our bookkeeper, her mother died a couple of weeks ago. And I'm like, okay, you know, that happens. And of course, you're going to have to allow people to be human. If you want to be treated like a human, you're going to have to treat people like humans. I'm sorry, I can get really worked up about this. <laughs> no, um, it's totally understood. I think 
we all had these moments. I think um, there is a question that we can use to wrap it up. All right. I think I had some other questions. Maybe I will remember. Uh, Mary Claire asks, how and where can I find my mentor? So for someone who is looking for a mentor, how hey, should Sheriff you? Just, Sheriff just commented, right? Because I was pregnant last year or um, from 2015 yeah. to May 2016, and we did a project. And Sheriff knows this. That while I was pregnant, I got a divorce, and I, and I was selling my house and everything. So, so things really got bad. And I kept on forgetting him. It's like, you know, he was one out of 14 translators on this team. And him and another translator, I just kept on forgetting paying their invoice. And I felt so bad about it. But, you know, he understood, and it was OK. He understood the situation. Yeah, usually people don't want to humbug you or something. Right. Although it does happen, but if you take precautions, I think there's a good chance you won't, you will not run into someone who is a scammer or something. Right. Not everybody is bad. Not everybody is evil. Not everybody is out to, to make our life miserable. Yeah, but a lot of translators, I think, uh, think like this, maybe after, after low rates, I don't know. Also about the low rates, uh, people saw, I read so many emails that say that we have to accept low rates, but I, I really cannot, un cannot understand how you can have to, tr to accept low rates. I mean. I don't have to do anything. That's why I became my own boss. I work on my own terms. And, you know, if, if, if you're open and, and if you're ready to find solutions, um, and, and that's also something that I do a lot in my mentoring is, you know, I, I try to find alternative ways just, than just the client saying, hey, I've got this text, how much is it going to be? And, and you slam your price per word at them. There's so many ways how you can try to accommodate a, a client's budget, and, and there's always ways to make it work. But you have to be open for that. And, um, and of course, you have to have a realistic, uh, you have to assess the value that you give your client realistically in order to, to not screw your client over by, by applying a rate that's too high, obviously. So, to wrap it up, I guess, um, the question was, where do you look for mentors? How do you find your mentor? How do you know if the person is yours? <laughs> Well, the, the first place that I would look um, for a mentor is obviously um, my, my national professional association, definitely. And then if you're in whatever groups, um, be it on Facebook, be it in Fora, be it on LinkedIn, whatever, um, try to find a group that has a good vibe and then just keep your eyes open. Um, if, if you run into somebody who constantly where you're thinking, yes, I understand that, and, and yes, I like this person, and hey, you know, cool comment. Just get in touch with them and ask if they'd like to. I mean, uh, many many mentors probably don't set out to, to actually become mentors. It's just something that you slip into. You know, you ask somebody for advice, and, and you get to talking. Um, and if you if you really got your mind set that you want to have a mentor, then go ahead and post that in those groups. I mean, it's it's likely that somebody will either point you in the right direction or somebody might say, hey, I've got time, I've got the resources, um, let's do this. Okay. The only thing that they can say is no, right? I mean, they, they will That's one of the lessons you will have to learn, to accept a no right. and to be ready for a no. I, I said that it would be the the to the question to wrap it up, but I actually just realized that we had this session for mentors, not mentees. So maybe you can also share some concluding words for mentors to set their minds in the right direction. Um, do it for the right reasons. And, and I mentioned those in the, be in the beginning, you know, because you want to do good for our profession. Um, 
do it with a mindset that you're creating your own network. I mean, who knows, maybe one day you want to retire and then you're going to, you're going to want to have people around you or in your network that you can, you know, trust with your clients, whatever. Um, or you get sick or you want to go on a holiday, whatever. Actually mentoring people and getting them to a point where they, where they sync with you is a real good way of, of building a trusted network. Um, don't ever ask for money because then you're a coach and when you start coaching you can stop translating. Those are two totally different um, professions. No, I'm a liar. I mean, I design websites too, so that would make me, you know. Well, you get my point. Um, do it for the right reasons and if, if you don't know where to find a mentee, ask your association if they're looking for mentors. I know there's far more want to be mentees than want to be mentors. Um, wanting to be, not want to be. So, yeah. Great. Thank you. Uh, that was very inspiring for me personally as a want to be mentor. I hope for, for others as well. You will be able to, to all the guys who watch this, you will be able to watch the replay here. Tanya, thanks for coming and good luck with your nomination. Thank I you hope so you much. win. And I, I not ask, but everyone in the room has the option of voting for Tanya. You can see the tab useful links on the left and there is a link to Tanya's Prozit CCA nomination. Uh, I really wish you good luck because for me, even that you haven't been my formal mentor, I did receive a lot of valuable advice from you. Thank you. And I'm sure others did as well. My pleasure. Good luck and uh, good luck with your other endeavors too. I hope to see you in some other webinar next time. Definitely. Whenever the topic okay. lends itself, I'd be happy to. And to everybody out there, especially Sheriff, hi, it was good to spend this session with you. And Paz, I hope you feel better soon. Okay. See you next time. And thanks for coming. Take care. Bye-bye. Ta-ta. Yeah.